The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. My name is Andrew Capehart with the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center, or the APS TARC, and I want to welcome you to the webinar, Grief, Depression, and Suicide in Older Adults, with our presenter, Jessica Burke, who I will introduce shortly. Um, next slide. Um, before we get started, I want to share a little bit of information. This webinar is being hosted by the APS TARC, which is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, administered by WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Um, next slide. A bit about the APS TARC, if you're not familiar. Um, the mission of the APS TARC is to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies, and providing individualized technical assistance to APS programs. This means we're here to help APS programs in any way that we can. So if you're a state APS person and you've got some issues going on, or even if you're county, reach out to us um, and we'll be happy to help you as best we can. So, uh, next slide. A quick promo for Let's Talk APS, our monthly peer support discussions. We have two informal collaborative peer calls each month, one centered around practice to discuss training, investigation, care planning, and that's the third Wednesday of every month, and then another around program management to discuss policy and programmatic issues, which is the fourth Wednesday of every month. You've got um, a little more information on your screen right now. Um, reach out to us using the contact info uh, that will be displayed at the end of the webinar if you're interested in joining one of these calls. Uh, next slide. And a quick reminder about the National Adult Protective Services Training Center, or the NATC, which has launched now. Um, this is a no-cost core program e-learning um, system of courses available for APS professionals to access free of charge. There's no cost for this. Um, please visit their website, uh, on the website on this slide for additional information. Um, these really are great courses. If you haven't checked them out, we highly encourage you to check out the NATC courses. We're really excited about everything that they have to offer right now for APS. So, uh, next slide. Now on to some housekeeping. Um, in the handout section of your webinar control panel, you'll find today's slides. You can download these slides anytime you like. Um, you can use your computer speakers to access audio for this webinar. Please make sure the volume for your computer is turned up to the desired level. If you experience any audio problems or connection issues during the presentation, uh, we recommend that you sign out of the webinar and then re-enter. That usually fixes a lot of the issues that you may have. So just exit out and then come right back in. Hopefully that will fix things. Uh, next slide. You may ask questions or share comments by typing them in the questions box at any time during the presentation. Uh, you don't have to wait until we're done to ask questions of the presenter. You can type them in as they occur to you. And we will relay those at the end of the presentation um, you know, for the Q&A portion um, of the webinar. This presentation is being recorded. It will be posted to the APS TARC website at a later date. It usually takes us about three to four weeks to post those. We'll copy the slides and, and put them on the website as well. We'll notify everyone who's registered for today's webinar when uh, that webinar recording is live and the slides are available to look at. We'll make sure you get an email about that. And everyone attending today will receive an email approximately 24 hours after the event with a certificate of attendance in case you need that. No, this is not a, these are not CEUs, it's just a certificate that you attended today. And then also please be sure to take the brief survey that will pop up um, at the end of the webinar. We really want to hear your feedback. We want to know what you think of this webinar and suggestions for future webinars. So, uh, next slide. All right, so I think we're going to launch a quick poll. Um, I think I will do that right now. The question will pop up on your screen. What profession do you identify most closely with? Are you an adult protective services professional, a medical professional, are you a legal professional? Do you consider yourself some sort of other social services professional or are you in a profession that doesn't meet any of these? And you can vote by clicking directly on your screen to vote for any of these. If you're in full screen mode, you may need to hit escape and exit that for a second if you'd like to vote. Um, but again, you can just click um, on, directly on your screen to vote for whichever of these options uh, seem to fit most. And we will leave this up for just a second to give folks a chance to vote. 
And let's see, I think I'll leave this up maybe 10 more seconds. Most folks have voted. All right, I'm gonna close that poll out right now and share the results with everyone. So overwhelmingly 54% are adult protective services professionals, 2% are medical, 4% are legal, 37% other social services professional, and then 4% are with another profession. So thanks so much for taking that poll. We really appreciate it. It helps us understand um, you know, who is in the audience that, um, that we're speaking to today. So thanks for that. Um, next slide. Uh, another uh, attendee question, but this is not necessarily a poll. You can type your answer to this in the questions box. What are you hoping to learn from the webinar today? What are you hoping to come away with um, having learned from attending this webinar from Jessica Burke, who I'll introduce shortly, who's, who's a brilliant speaker. So I'll give folks just a second to type. There's a box that says chat slash questions or questions slash chat. Let us know what you're thinking as far as um, you know, what you'd like to learn from today's webinar. So we'll give that just a minute. Not seeing any answers just yet. So maybe we'll come back to that here in just a little bit, right before, um, before right after I introduce Jessica. So um, why don't we move on to the next slide? So I, it is my great pleasure to introduce um, today's speaker, Jessica Burke. Um, Jessica is the newest member of the APS TARC team. She joined us last month. We're very happy to have her. And a little bit about Jessica. Uh, she's worked in the field of social work for about 20 years, specifically serving various adult protective service agencies. Jessica is a subject matter expert in all areas of APS practice, which includes investigation, policy, assessment, developing curriculum, training, and building APS organizations. Jessica's also worked as the Assistant Director of Workforce Development at Sacramento State University College of Continuing Education, um, in which she created a new social work induction program serving 28 of California's Northern County. Jessica's a professional speaker and has presented events and conferences across the nation. And we are very fortunate to have her here with us today. So why don't I summarize just a little bit about what folks were wanting to hear from the webinar today. Um, how to assist an elder experiencing grief, understanding causes and triggers, um, like to learn more about grief and depression in older adults and what the sign, what signs to look out for, uh, have more of an understanding of depression amongst older adults, um, gain a better understanding of grief and suicide with older adults. So yeah, pretty, pretty consistent across the board. All right, so I'm gonna shut up now and let Jessica take things over from here. Jessica, you have the floor. All right, thank you so much, Andy, for having me today and thank you all who are on the uh, webinar today for taking time out of your busy day to invest in your own professional development and the clients that you serve. So I want to dive into a little bit of a background and purpose. So uh, in meeting with Tark and Andy, we decided to present this particular webinar to really enhance social service practices to address grief, depression, suicidality, in older adults and really come away with a common nomenclature, right? Because the way that you may ask suicide questions or I may ask suicide questions may look I didn't have any training on asking the suicide questions. And I remember the first time that somebody in front of me said that they were suicidal, I was more uncomfortable with how I was feeling with their admission than I was with the person sitting across from me. So hopefully this webinar is gonna provide you training and tools for identifying risk factors and indicators for grief, grief depression, and suicide in older adults. I do wanna caution you, uh, content warning here. So this training can evoke a strong emotional response. So I'm just letting you know in advance, we've all been touched by grief, depression, and suicide one way or another, whether it be personally, professionally, so I just wanted to shout it out. Uh, if you do need to debrief with somebody afterwards, I suggest you have uh, somebody available. The other thing I wanted to talk about was language. Uh, so heard of the term commit suicide, right? We are getting away from that language. We have not already because of the word commit, right? So you're gonna hear different language from myself today, such as death by suicide or suicided, 
but commit suicide language will also be in this because we are transitioning that language uh, slowly but surely. So just wanted to give you a little heads up there. Uh, so where are we going today? For the next hour and a half, I always like to arrive at a destination. So we're gonna be defining the different types of grief and how it impacts older adults. You'll be able to comprehend suicide and suicidal ideation among older adults. We're gonna explain the assessment process for identifying risk factors, warning signs, and symptoms related to suicide. And then finally, we're gonna talk about secondary trauma and the importance of self-care in helper professions. What I see a lot of is we get all this great training for helping uh, the population that we serve, but I always like to end on a note to make sure that we are getting training to ensure that our needs are being met as well. So we will end with that today. So Andy's gonna go ahead and launch another attendee poll. So the first question, there's gonna be two. Do you currently screen for depression when seeing a client? And the answers are yes, no, or unsure. So Andy, you ready to launch that? I am, yes, I have launched that poll and, and people are voting right now. I've switched to a different headset. I think we had an echo a minute ago. Um, hopefully okay. folks can feel me a little bit better, so, or hear me a little bit better. Um, we will leave this open for another 20 seconds or so, so folks can vote. You can click directly on your screen to vote. If you are in full screen mode, you may need to exit that um, in order to, to vote. Um, we'll leave it open maybe another 15 seconds or so. And again, you can click directly on your screen to vote. All right, I'm going to close that out now um, and share the results. And it looks like 52% say yes, 38% say no, and 10% aren't quite sure um, if they okay. suffer depression or not. So, yeah. All right, thank you for that. Yep. So our next question is, do you currently create screen for suicide when seeing a client? Same answers, yes, no, or unsure. And I'm going to launch that poll as well. Just like last time, you can vote by clicking on your screen. We'll leave it up for another 30 seconds or so. And since the majority of our attendees today are with Adult Protective Services, it'll be interesting to see. Absolutely. What the answers are to this. So. All right, maybe another 10 seconds. All right, I'm going to close that out and share the results there as well. And 42% yes, 50% no, and 9% are not sure. So, okay. Um, yeah. Interesting results. Right. Thank you. Sure. Very interesting. Glad to hear. So, good. Well, thank you for, for participating in those two poll questions. And let's go ahead and dive right in. So, one of the questions that came across the chat box, right? Let's talk about grief. So when putting this training together, I originally put it together for Riverside County and I've uh, enhanced it for APS TARC. But when I was putting together the suicide training on suicide and really researching it, I noticed that there was a little bit of a hiccup, right? With before going to suicide, we need to know what exactly grief and depression is. And not just like grief as a manifest, right? Because all of us have a picture of what grief is, but actually defining it and applying it to those that we serve. So right here on the screen, grief is the emotional reaction to a significant loss, such as the death of a loved one or no longer being independent with your ADLs. Whatever the loss may be, some level of grief will naturally follow. Anticipatory grief, that's a new term that I had learned uh, before putting together this training, is that experience, those emotions experienced in advance of an impending loss. Grieving is the process of emotional and life adjustment one goes through after a loss. Grieving after a loved one's death is known as bereavement. And this right here is really important. Grieving is a personal experience. So it depends on who the person is and what their coping skills are. What is their emotional intelligence? What is their strength? What is their resiliency? And the nature of the loss. So I typically don't share a whole lot of personal stories, but I'm gonna share one today. Uh, it's about one of the first dogs I have. Uh, and I wanna let you know, I know that some of you may be experiencing grief now. Some of you have had a, a tremendous loss, but for the purpose of this training, I'm going to be uh, speaking to uh, a dog uh, that I had. Uh, so her name was Twinkie. 
Uh, Twinkie was a Welsh Corgi. So for those of you who don't know, Welsh Corgi are the low rider dogs with the stumpy legs and the pointy ears. And uh, she was my best friend. I had her for 14 years from the time I was 26. She went everywhere with me. Everybody knew Jessica and Twinkie. This was my baby. So of course, over time, as she got older, she became ill. And uh, long story short, but she went into kidney failure. We did heroics, we did dialysis. And uh, one night uh, she woke up on the bed and she was breathing a little hard. And uh, I, I knew it was time. I'd never put down an animal before. So I uh, set the, all that up for a couple of days or two days later. It just so happened I was training my first induction class uh, the next day for Riverside County. And when I get into training mode, I get into training mode, right? I, I had nothing else on my mind. So I was in the middle of training 30 of my students. I wasn't even thinking about Twinkie and what was coming up. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I broke down crying, sobbing. Thank goodness my partner, uh, Shantae, who's actually on this webinar today, jumped up, you know, stood in for me. I went into the bathroom, cried it out. But what I want what I want to stress to you is I did not know what anticipatory grief was. And it can creep up on you without even knowing it. So let's go on to our next slide. So symptoms of grief, we have, I'm not going to go through these verbatim, but physical expressions, right? So crying, headaches. It says may weaken the immune system. Grief actually does weaken the immune system, regardless of age, regardless of any medical diagnosis. So you could be in your mid-20s, completely healthy, and if you are going through a time of grieving, it is going to weaken that immune system. So think about the clients that we serve, our older adults that have those pre-existing conditions and medical diagnoses. We have the emotional expressions, social expressions. Isolation is huge. Isolation is the number one risk factor that puts somebody at risk of abuse. So is a client isolating? And then spiritual expressions. So grieving a significant loss takes time. As I said earlier, how you and I could have gone through the same loss, but how you grieve and how I grieve and how long it takes may look completely different. Excuse me. There's no time for overcoming grief. You know, we've heard that it's been three months, get over it, snap out of it, it's been a year, right? There is no time frame for overcoming grief. And the grieving process does not necessarily happen in a step-by-step -step orderly fashion. And the length of time grieving depends upon many factors. So what is the relationship, personality attributes, support system, and then your holidays and dates, so anniversary reaction. So that could be a date of diagnosis, a date of death, a birthday, a holiday, any, any of those. So uh, let's go back to Twinkie. So I went through a pretty big depressive state, right? That was my, my dog child. And uh, I was pretty depressed for several months. So my husband went to the pet store and brought home a brand new Corgi puppy. So he walks in the door all proud of himself with a brand new Corgi puppy. And he's like, here, Jessica, this, should, this, this is gonna make you feel better. This was Cooper. By the way, Cooper is alive and well and living his best life. <laughs> But I broke down crying again because, again, we were grieving differently. Where my husband was still missing Twinkie, he thought that let's fix it this way by getting another puppy, where for me, I was still going through that grieving process. Again, we all grieve in a different way. Same with our clients. I do want to talk about the anniversary reaction. Many of our clients may not know that that's creeping up on them. There may be a trigger. I've had clients say, I don't think about the date, but I can feel the seasons changing out in the world. And that's how I know of this reminder that's creeping up on me. My anniversary reaction came at a very, at least in my own thoughts, uh, odd time. My husband and I hand out uh, candy every year for Halloween. And instead of somebody banging on our door, we put our camping chairs out front and have the trick-or-treaters come to us. Twinkie was a little 20 pound dog, but she was very social. She loved Halloween. She loved seeing the kids. The kids loved petting her. Everybody knew Twinkie in our neighborhood. So if Twinkie wasn't out during Halloween, that little dog was going to bust down the door. <laughs> Not even joking. So Twinkie used to sit under my camping chair, and I could feel her with my feet. So my husband and I are handing out candy, having a great time. Wasn't even thinking about it. I put my feet under the chair, and I couldn't feel her. I start busting down crying, and my husband's looking at me like, what is going on? Well, she had been under my feet for 13 years on Halloween. So that was an anniversary reaction that triggered me. 
So some of the anniversary actions may seem more common, like, oh, it's Christmas or, oh, it's, you know, my loved one who I lost birthday. But some of them you may not know when that anniversary reaction is going to creep up on you. Uh, the most common form of con uh, condition is depression, anxiety. We have physical illness and PTSD. What I want to point out to you, uh, what it was formerly known as complicated grief, so persistent complex bereavement disorder. So this is a diagnosis given to somebody who experiences an unusually disabling or prolonged response to bereavement. And uh, I am not a psychiatrist, but uh, I get questions all the time. Well, Jessica, how do we know, right, when, when somebody has that persistent complex bereavement disorder? So aside from diagnosing, it's really looking at the situation in its entirety, right? So I had a client that had lost her husband of many years uh, she was constantly going into the emergency room having panic attacks to the point where she would have, for about three months into her grieving, her provider would drive her down there. She would open the door and crawl into the emergency room because the panic and the anxiety attacks were so severe. So the doctor early on had diagnosed her with this uh, persistent complex bereavement disorder. I've also seen people who eat very little, they're not going to counseling, they're not, you know, regaining new relationships and a new identity and they don't get diagnosed maybe till a year later so as far as that period uh, just my opinion is it just depends on the situation right so keep an eye out for that especially clients who lose a you know adult child that lives with them or a spouse they may start isolating and that's the first step towards persistent complex bereavement disorder uh, because it becomes very disabling and can affect many, many different aspects uh, of their life. So I'm not going to dive into this, but I do want to talk about the Kubler-Ross grief cycle and how it will look to you and your practice out in the field, right? So uh, as you all maybe heard, heard in college, Dr. Kubler-Ross was, I believe, a Swedish psychiatrist, and she came up with uh, this cycle, the grief cycle. Also, she wrote a book on death and dying. And her research showed that when a person grieves, we go through this cycle and we go through this cycle in this order. So denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Other people push back at her work saying, yeah, you know, I've, I've gone through grief. I've had a big loss and I, I wasn't angry, I, I didn't go through bargaining. And she would say, no, 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 you did. You just weren't aware of it. Several years go by, she experiences some loss herself. She goes back and looks back at her research and redacts some of it. So what she says is, do these stages exist? Absolutely, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. You may go through some of them, you may go through all of them. They may not be in order. You could get stuck in one. And the most common one to get stuck in is depression. So you may go to acceptance and an anniversary reaction may occur where it pulls you back down into depression. So what I want you to get out of this slide, right, need to know is look for those clients who may get stuck in depression. What can we do for them? So challenges of older adult grief, they may experience several losses within a short amount of time. They may not know that they're grieving. They may be unwilling to admit it. They may lack the support they once had. How many of you have heard clients, you know, when you go and say, do you have family members? Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I know I'm in California, but I have a son in Michigan. Oh, how often do you talk to him? Well, uh, I don't want to bother him. So I, I talk to him at Christmas, right? So, you know, we've heard it too. Oh, I, I'm letting them live their own life. And then older adults may experience as losses related to the aging process itself. So giving up roles such as driving and loss of finances and possessions. Another story. I had a client that I'd been out there several times uh, for elder abuse investigations, and it was more like a caregiver issue and other people getting involved, kind of more one of those. But uh, I'd seen him several times over the years, and I, I go out one, one time, and he had lost his driver's license and was devastated about it. And he said, Jessica, I really don't think you understand the loss. And I said, well, you're right. I, I don't, because I haven't experienced losing my driver's license, so I don't know what that's like. And he goes, no, no, you really don't. 
He goes, can I ask you something? I said, absolutely, you can ask me whatever you want. He goes, Jessica, what happens if you wake up in the middle of the night and you want a double Western bacon cheeseburger from Carl's Jr.? And I look at him, thinking to myself, I don't know where this question is going. But as I start to answer him, well, I get up and go, and then I pause. And he said, Jessica, I can't do that. I have to either wait for a caregiver to get here or I go without. And that really put things into perspective for me because the things that we take for granted regarding our ADLs and our IADLs, right? If we forget something for a meal or if we don't feel like cooking, just jumping in the car and going, he had put in perspective that he didn't have that option anymore. He didn't have that luxury. Loss of finances and possessions. Many times when you have clients who are married, one spouse passes away, their income goes with them. You go out in the field, so you have the remaining spouse that's not only adjusting to the loss of their spouse, but they're also maybe having to sell their family home or move somewhere else because of the loss of finances as well. So that can really double up on that grief and make it a lot more complicated. So tips for addressing grief, right? We, as social workers, I think we really have a, we're in a beautiful position. Uh, in, in any profession that's on here today, we're in a beautiful posi position, uh, position, excuse me, because it's, we're all collecting the same information. We're all going out and seeing uh, the population that we serve, right? But how we do that, how we use our personalities, how we can be creative is something that really makes us special. And it's almost like a blank slate where we can all paint our own pictures. So tips for addressing grief, be available. Be available. I, I hear it, Jessica, this is a hustle job. Jessica, I know I gotta get from one client to another, but you never know when you're gonna make a difference in that one person's life. I had a gentleman who had uh, lost his wife of almost 60 years and uh, she had passed away suddenly and painfully. She had been diagnosed with late stage pancreatic cancer uh, and from onset to death was weeks. And they had chose to put her uh, in hospice. She stayed in her home and uh, she eventually passed away. And he had, I got the report on my desk from the police department that this gentleman had gone to her grave with a gun and was gonna take his life over her grave. So the police intervene, they take his gun. He didn't get placed on a hold. I, you know, it's probably another discussion, but uh, they take him back to his house and then they, they call me out. So I, I get there, beautiful mobile home, pictures of him and his wife all over the house at different stages of their life, his and hers recliners. Uh, he has me sit down in what was formerly her recliner. I noticed that he had her rings on his pinky finger. And so we're talking, he's very open and honest with me. And he said that a chaplain from hospice had been coming out and seeing him, but it wasn't really helpful. And I said, oh, I said, okay. I said, what do you feel like you need? He kind of looks around the room. He looks at his pictures and he starts playing with the ring on his finger. And he said, Jessica, he said, all I want to do is talk about my love, my wife, and my life. So I look at him and his eyes were filling up with tears. I had a box in my hand taking notes. So I put the box down. And I said, I would love to hear about your life. So he goes on to tell me that they had known each other since elementary school, uh, got married right out of high school. He went into the military, had gone overseas to war, and uh, she was still living on base. And he got this big smile. He goes, look how, and he shows me a picture. He goes, look how pretty she was. And, you know, I, all these other military men wanted to take her out on a date. She was, she was, you know, said, I'm married. I'm very faithful to me. And he was just so proud. Then he just goes on talking about, you know, coming back, having children, their life together, going on cruises, all this fun stuff. And uh, so then he stops and he takes this big, deep breath with a shudder. <sighs> he goes, Jessica, that felt so good. That's what I've needed to talk about my love, my wife and my life. After that discussion, we sat down and talked about, uh, you know, uh, cancer survivors group for the, you know, remaining spouses. It so happened he lived in a mobile home park that have, had over 600 residents. They had a grief support group there and he was connected to the VA. 
So we were able to get him to a support group there as well. So I followed up with him a couple days or a couple days and a couple weeks later, just to check and see how he's doing. He said, Jessica, I'm still grieving. I still cry every day. And, but he smiles and he goes, but you know what? I get to talk about my wife and my life every day. And he goes, it feels so good. The best thing you can do sometimes is just be available and give somebody your undivided attention. And when I say undivided attention, an example is when we say, right, to be polite, oh, hey, how's it going? How are you doing? But if I sit down across from you and say, hey, tell me how you're doing. You're going through a lot right now. I, I really want to know how you're doing, right? Two totally different sets of scripts. So set the stage for your client to be vulnerable. Allow them permission to tell their story. Listen without giving advice, okay? Be careful with the, I know what you're going through. I completely understand. Be careful there because you may have experienced the exact same type of loss, but your grief and that person's grief may look completely different. And then of course, I know you all know this, but be patient, kind, and understanding. Y'all are subject matter experts with your resources, so support groups, grief counseling, and then yourselves, even outside of this training. Research, right? Learning about grief and what to expect, so expressing those feelings, building new relationships, and developing a new identity. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about suicide, but more uh, related to grief as well. So. As you all know, the older adult population is exploding. So completed suicides for older adults are higher than any other age group. So completed suicide for all ages are one in 12. For older adults, it is one in four. Think about for that for a minute. That number could actually be worse. It could be one in three, one in two, because what that number does not account for is passive suicide, right? In order for suicide to be listed on a death certificate, it has to be intentional. So think about the people who are maybe on a diabetic diet, right? They've always had uncontrolled diabetes, but they decide purposely not to take their insulin for an, a long amount of time, wanting to die. Think about somebody who's uh, who suffers from alcoholism and takes pain pills. They have a history of that but decides one night just to take a little bit more. What is that gonna be listed on the death certificate? So keep in mind that number may actually be worse. Older adults are three times more likely to die by suicide than any other age group. It is estimated that an older adult dies by suicide every 90 minutes. So the length of this training. This next bullet point is huge. You have a one in five chance of having a client end their life by suicide during your professional career. Half of older adults that die by suicide do not have a diagnosed mental health condition. And that could be based upon, right, the different models of healthcare, uh, where some doctors are still saying that depression is a normal part of aging. I can tell you research out there Depression is not a normal part of aging. It is, in, it is treatable in older adults as it is in every other age group. And then suicide among older adults has been deemed a serious global public health problem. So let's talk about suicide risk in older adults. What is it? So we talked about passive suicide already, right? So suicide is a death that is self-inflicted. There has to be evidence. There has to be evidence that that person wanted to die. We're going to be talking about risk assessments that you can conduct to evaluate the level of likelihood of suicidal ideation. Who? There we go. Social workers, nurses, physicians, psychiatrists, psychologists, and or mental health clinicians. Clinicians. Why? And why are we here today? Why are we on this training? Older adults have the highest rate of suicide. So I'm not going to go over this verbatim. Uh, I'll let you look at this, but here's some things that can put a person at risk of suicide. So, um, you know, losses, we've talked about the economic, the spouse, the physical disabilities, isolation. Remember, the number one thing that puts a person at risk of elder abuse, 
dysfunctional coping skills, right? All of our coping skills on this call today, there's 376 people here, look completely different, okay? And then personality factors is huge as well. So assessing suicide in older adults, a client may have thoughts of ending their own life if they have lost a spouse or a long-term support. Past thoughts of suicide is a factor, an indicator for future thoughts of suicide, especially while grieving. Any thoughts of suicide must be taken seriously. Okay, another story. I had a gentleman, he was a wrestling star, so he was a dependent adult. He was in his early 20s and he had gotten a scholarship for his wrestling, uh, but unfortunately he had an accident at one of his meets and became paralyzed from the neck down. So I had seen him several times. There were caregiver issues because mom was caring for him, girlfriend was caring for him. A lot of dynamics going on. So I go out there one time and he was also in a second story house. That's where his uh, room was. So it made it difficult to get him to appointments. So I go out there and I'm talking to him and he goes, Jessica, he said, I'm having thoughts about killing myself. And I said, oh my gosh. I said, First of all, I said, thank you for having the strength to tell me that and, and trusting with that information. Um, I said, but can you tell me a little bit about that? And he said, well, Jessica, all my friends are in college. I'm depressed. I sit here in bed all day. I, I can't even do anything on my own. And I used to be an athlete. So I, I decided I'm going to kill myself. I said, okay. I said, well, tell me what, what are you thinking about or how are you going to take your own life? And he said, well, I've decided I'm gonna go jump out of my second story window. So in that moment, was I worried about him jumping out of the story window being paralyzed from the neck down? I was not. Was I concerned that he was having these thoughts of ending his own life? Absolutely. So we ended up getting him, long story short, in counseling. Uh, there are programs out there that allow athletes that have been injured to tell their story and he ended up being able, he presented at many different conventions about adjusting to life after a sports injury. And he was even very, very truthful and open that he had thoughts of ending his own life. But now this gave him a new purpose. So again, was I worried that he was actually gonna follow through? No, because he didn't have the ability to. But was I worried about what mental health state he was in? Absolutely. It's okay to ask direct open-ended questions. They're uncomfortable questions. Asking somebody if they're suicidal, asking somebody how they're gonna do it, right? If they have the means, those are uncomfortable questions. But here's what I tell my participants that take this class. We need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. With my years in training in suicide, I still don't like having those conversations. When I say I don't like, I mean, they're, make, you know, makes me a little nervous. They're uncomfortable. But I need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable so I can execute my job in the best way to keep my person or client happy, healthy, and free from abuse. Other thing I want to point out, avoid leading questions. There was something in the news story years ago. Don't quote me on this one. I get so many stories, I, I forget the exact. Um, uh, exact reference sometimes, but it happened to be with somebody who was going to their workplace that was going to possibly hurt somebody at work and then take their own life. And so they had called 911 dispatch, police was on the phone with them. And the question was, you're not going to go do this, are you? Well, what did this person say? And they ended up uh, taking their own life. So, you know, we don't want to ask those questions. We need to be okay having that open conversation, that truthful conversation even if it's uncomfortable, and even if you don't know what to do, you can learn together. You can learn together. You can step out, call a supervisor, step out, talk to somebody. Okay? But today, first step, for those of you who haven't done it already, you're in this training, so. Okay, so the threat of carrying out the plan is very real if they have the means, have a set in time place, and think that there are no other options to end their pain. So I have a quote down here that actually came from one of our mental health doctors here in Riverside County. And I have it bolded on purpose because there is a misconception out there 
that if we ask somebody if they're having those thoughts, that we're going to plant that seed in their mind, right? So I'm going to read this verbatim. Asking somebody if he or she is having suicidal thoughts does not make him or her more likely to act upon those thoughts and in fact has been shown to reduce the risk. So if you get anything out of this training today, it's get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Don't be afraid to ask these questions. And the third one we haven't gotten to yet because that is your self-care. These screening tools, there's lots out there, okay? What I do want to say is there's not one tool or me measure that will positively identify those who will take their own life. I have screened clients for suicide. They have been put on holds. I've gone out there and done case management with them, and they've still ended up taking their own life. So I, I do want to get that out there that you will not, any, even if you use these tools, there's no positive identification, okay? So Riverside County did research probably about four years ago uh, here in Southern California because they had noticed an uptake, uh, an uptick, excuse me, in persons taking their own life. So here's some depression screening tools. My understanding is the last time I checked, they're still free and they're evidence-based. So it's the Patient Health Questionnaire 2 and the Patient Health Questionnaire 9. So I'll let you all look that up. I would have provided a link, but there were several different links on there, and I didn't know which one was the best. I'm just being honest. So you can go ahead and put that in your search engine. But uh, everybody, any client gets asked the PHQ-2. So there are two questions. Every single client in Riverside County, right, whether or not they're showing symptoms of depression, whether or not they have a history of depression, every single client is getting asked two questions. Depending on that score, seven additional questions will follow. We also ask the ASQEM, so it's Ask Suicide Questions. I did give you a link for that, the National Institute of Mental Health. This is comprised of three questions. Every single client gets those questions, regardless of history with suicide, regardless of any mental health diagnoses. Uh, so look these up if you want to. Again, last time I checked, they're free. When we did our research at Riverside County, they are all evidence-based. So for those of you who may want to look into that, there they are for you. So let's talk a little bit about the results. So Riverside County policy polls data quarterly. So this was our most recent set of results from pulling the data from the PHQ-29 and the ASQEM, which I think uh, really are positive outcomes, right? So we see a 10% here, but before I dive into that, would we have gotten this number if we wouldn't have asked the questions? Okay, I'll leave that there. So 10% indicated having moderate to severe depression when asked those questions. 10% deemed positive for suicide. So that is suicidal ideation over the past month, a history of suicide attempts, or current suicidal ideation. And what these results allowed was the social worker to come in with additional interventions, additional resources to help support that person uh, with these scores. Uh, and these interventions ended up turning out great because we did additional case staffing as well. So when somebody had moderate to severe depression or positive for suicide, there would be a required case staffing between the supervisor and the social worker. And before case closure, there would be a case staffing between the manager, the supervisor, and the social worker. So it allowed different persons to put a lens on that case to make sure that we came full circle with any interventions or resources that we provided uh, to that client to hopefully decrease that risk. So. Uh, again, I think these numbers are great because what, uh, again, as I said, what always, what I always think about is what would the numbers be if we didn't ask these questions. Uh, so here's some reliable mental health resources. Some of you may or may not be familiar with these. So you have the National Institute of Mental Health. We have SAMHSA. We have mentalhealth.gov, Centers for Disease Control, the VA, 
Uh, you all probably have state, county, and local resources. You know, reach out to these places and say, hey, what are your resources? Some of the best VA resources I got was reaching out to VA social workers and asking for their resource list. So I know, you know, here in Riverside County, it's a pretty populated metropolitan area. Um, as Andy had said when he introduced me, I also serve 28 of our northern counties, some which are very remote and geographically diverse. And what they've been doing is, especially with the onset of COVID, right, we're going to more Zoom, we're going more online, is they've been able to get more online resources, staffing, um, psych psychologist visits, whatever that may be, due to us going more online. So for those of you who may not have that tool toolkit built, don't reinvent the wheel. Reach out to those places that you already know and ask them for their resource list. All right, so we have talked about grief. We have talked about depression. We've talked about some tools. We have talked about suicide. I want to talk about you for a minute, okay? Every single day, you're going out in the field and seeing people in crisis. People may be coming into your office in crisis, right? They don't come to us when they're not in crisis. They're going through some type of traumatic event. So what I want to do is talk about secondary trauma for a minute. What I notice as helper professions, right, as people in a helper professions, we are amazing at taking care of everybody else. I'll get in trainings or conferences all the time. How many of you, you know, you all got to this webinar today. How many of you get your kids to the doctor on time? How many of you wake up for work on time? How many of you right, get out into the field and see your clients on time. But when I ask, do you make your doctor's appointments? What are you doing for self-care, right? We're amazing at taking care of everybody else. Who do we often fail to care for? That's right, turn that finger around. I'm guilty of it too. Secondary trauma is alive and well. So let's look at this. Let's look at the working definition. So secondary trauma is experienced indirectly through hearing details or witnessing the aftermath of trauma experienced by another person. So every person on this day experiences indirect trauma because of what you hear or what you see of the people that you serve. So those who work in helping professions, there we go, social workers, we have some counselors on here, first responders and police officers, right? you are at a greater risk of experiencing secondary trauma or secondary trauma stress. So let's talk a little bit about this. I am gonna share a story that may be upsetting to some people, but uh, I had a, and I can't go into too much, but I had a gentleman uh, who had, he was, he was in his early 60s, and he had recently been diagnosed with a very debilitating disease, uh, Lou Gehrig's. A very outgoing gentleman, uh, healthiest whole life, owned his own business, great guy. Uh, his mom lived with him, he was taking care of her, and he had thoughts of ending his own life that was new to him, so he became proactive and took himself to the hospital. So hospital, you know, evaluated him, talked to him, and then released him back home, filed an APS report, then I go out there. Uh, so long story short, he was like at a loss. He goes, just I don't know where my mind was, I don't know what I was thinking. I'm, you know, I, I, I just, I've never experienced this before, so I didn't know what to do. And so I said, you know, I'm, I'm really, really sorry. Let's talk about this together. So what uh, he said was, you know, no history of depression, no history of suicide. I was able to validate or verify that through his doctor. And he said, you know, I just, I, I, I didn't know what to do. I talked to my doctor. He said, here's the progression of the disease. And so I just thought there were no other options. He goes, but you know, after going to the hospital, after talking to somebody, he goes, I actually wanna take this as an opportunity to help others who may receive a detrimental diagnosis and I wanna be able to help them. I wanna be able to be like a spokesperson for them, right? So he and I spent quite a bit of time with them, get to know his mom and uh, he, you know, together we call and we make an appointment with a neurologist. Uh, we make an appointment with a counselor. He is just, he gives me a big hug. I'm, I'm not a big hugger out in the field, but he gives me a big hug and I you know, kind of pat back and was, you know, thankful for my time and 
you know, we did safety planning, we did all that, you know, and he said, you know, I will never do that to my mom, she depends on me. So we had a great, great, great conversation. So I leave feeling great. Come back the next day to see how everybody's doing and the front door was open. I stepped in just enough because there's a sofa table there and I called for him, called for mom. I see mom in the background kind of shuffling. She says, come in, come in. And so I come in and I look down on the sofa table and, um, excuse me, the client's glasses were there on top of a forest lawn mortuary card. So I call 911, the police come out. My client had hung himself in his garage with a truck tie down. And that really affected me bad. So I got so much support from my county, I can't even believe it. So the first thing that happened was I called my after called 911, police were there. The coroner happened to be running about six hours that day. So I, I had to wait. And uh, the first thing my supervisor did was pull another social worker off of her caseload to go stay with me. And that supervisor was also checking on me every 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes. My manager got in his car and drove to the house to check on me, which I really appreciate because I, I was in shock and I was still trying to do my job all at the same time. Several hours go by, coroner comes, I go back to the office and uh, my manager and supervisor, well, first of all, my fellow social workers come and give me a hug, right? Because I have no problem saying I need you. I need my fellow social workers. We all need each other. I have no problem saying that, right? But uh, I get pulled in the office, Jessica, you know, and it's, it, here's, we have a client death, but the first thing is, how are you doing? What do you need? Do you need time off? Here's an employee assistance program for sure. What, tell us what you need. And I really appreciated that because I hear, to kind of step back a little bit, I hear, Jessica, I just witnessed this traumatic event. And the expectation is that I go from one client to the next client. Is that the expectation it is? I, I can't candy coat that. But what we need to do is be patient and kind to ourselves and say, I saw something very traumatic or I saw something upsetting and I'm not okay with it. I'm not okay with it. It's, it's upsetting me. I need to talk about it. In our profession, you know, we deal with family dynamics. We deal with people who are experiencing trauma, crisis, or loss. But how are we dealing with it, right? A lot of times we put it in a compartment and put it away. And that is not a healthy way to deal with it. Many people ask what I did. Uh, I obviously went through a little bit of a depression. And uh, I sought counseling through my religious organization. I'm not promoting any religion on here, but that's what I chose to do. And my counselor had said to me, because I said, what's wrong with me? I'm not getting over this. What's wrong with me? Why can't I move on? And he said, Jessica, what you saw is really upsetting. There is no, you should just get over it. But I was being hard on myself. Like, why can't I move on? I've had clients die on my caseload constantly, but this one really shook my world. I happened to be watching a news special uh, a couple weeks later on, uh, there was flooding back east and there was a family that had a farm and their, he was a great grandpa, grandpa, dad, but his family's on the news and their dad had been caught in a flooding situation. And so he had unfortunately drowned. So this family was screaming and crying and banging their heads. And, and I, I don't mean to sound callous here, but I'm thinking to myself, of course that's upsetting. And of course that's devastating, but wow, he was in his hundreds. That's, you know, again, don't mean to sound biased, but that's, but it just goes to show death, suicide, grief, it rattles everybody and it looks very different for all of us. So what it comes down to is giving yourself permission to say, I'm not okay. Permission to say, my job is hard and I saw something upsetting. Set the stage for yourself to be vulnerable. Because the last thing we want, we talk about self-care, right? 
I'm not going to tell you to go get a massage or go get your nails done. You all are subject matter experts on what recharges you. But what I'm talking about self-care is allowing yourself to process feelings and say, this is something I saw that upset me and I need to talk about it. There we go. Talk to somebody, supervisor, coworker, professional. My husband is an amazing man. I come home all the time, especially when I was out in the field and gripe about my day. And he's very supportive. But does anybody understand like my fellow social worker, like my partners out in the field? Absolutely not. So take that time and space for you to grieve. Take that time and space for you to rely on somebody else to keep you whole. Try to avoid negative self-talk. Easier said than done. I did the woulda, coulda, shoulda. What if I would have driven by that night? What if I would have come a little bit earlier? What, did, what box didn't I check? Could I have done something different? Why didn't I see this coming? Take the time to grieve. If you need to take time, take time. The job will always be there. You're no good to yourself. You're no good to your clients. You're no good to your family. If you are not 100%, I believe we start every day with an emotional dollar. What is your change at the end of the day? If it's five cents, 10 cents, we need to change that. Know the research. You have a one in five chance of having somebody die by suicide on your caseload. I've had about four. And then learn from the experience. Learn from the experience. I learned a lot. What I went through with that gentleman allowed me to be able to create this training and deliver this training to audiences across the nation. I've delivered this at the NAPSA conference. I've delivered this several different places. I created this training probably about five or six years, maybe even seven after that uh, client took his own life. And I remember the first time, uh, the first several times that I delivered this, I went back in my office and cried. So you just never know when it's going to creep up. So uh, I would like to say that I knew all of this, but I don't. <laughs> Here are all my references uh, for you if you want uh, to look at them. As Andy said, this is available. But I wanted to make sure that I have about 10 to 15, if not longer, minutes to talk about questions. Uh, so I kind of want to do like an hour of lecture and then really embed some time for questions. So Andy, I'm going to go ahead and go to you. Sure. If you want to, we have quite a few minutes, so I want to make sure. sure I get those questions answered. Yeah, certainly. And now's the time to type your questions into the questions box if you have not done that already, and I will relay them to to Jessica. And thank you, Jessica, for sharing all that and some of the um, stories that you told are very powerful. So, um, and we do have some questions already. I'm going to start with the first one, which is a little bit long. It's a personal story that someone shared. So, this person lost their mother um, five years ago, shortly before a holiday. Um, their parents were married for 45 years at the time of the death. Um, this person will bring up the death with her father, and then he immediately shuts down and says, I don't want to talk about it. How can I help my dad with his grief and get him to open up more about his wife? Uh, I'm sure that he's doing it because she had helped care for her mother before she passed away. And this person hopes to use whatever you say, you know, with clients as well. So let me know if you need me to repeat that, Jessica. Oh, yes, I got it. So I, I'm just thinking more advice versus, you know, clinical. I would set the stage for them. Okay, well, let me take a step back. Though. Remember, everybody grieves in a different way. So that may be his coping mechanism. Um, is that a healthy coping mechanism? We can discuss that further. But what, what I notice is people who, in my own experience, have been apprehensive to share is they really need to be given, like I said earlier, permission to be vulnerable. Hey, dad, you were married for 45 years and this was a tragic loss and it was a loss for me too and i i know we you know i, I try to talk about it and you shut down but i i really would like to talk about it and just see how you've processed this how have you handled this internally make it about them and it's i don't want to talk about it well dad i'm i'm really sorry you don't want to talk about it because i really would love to hear from you so that's um that's kind of what's worked for me out in the field um, I hope that's helpful and, you know, thankful. thank you for your question and for being vulnerable yourself and, and yeah. sharing that information. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I, I thought it was great that they were able to share that with us. 
Um, and this one you may not know the answer to, but it is a very interesting question. Is there research on countries that have lower suicide rates for elder adults, and how are they different from the United States? So I can partially answer that. I'm not going to be able to directly answer it. What it comes down to is that at least what I've seen in my research. So I haven't researched this topic directly, but indirectly, it's how countries view religion and how countries view death. So in some countries, death is a celebration, including the actual dying process. So you're seeing less suicide there. Um, you're also seeing less suicide in cultures where they, you know, uh, religious cultures that may say, if you know, you die, take your own life, that you're going directly to wherever it may be, um, you know, purgatory, hell. Uh, so that's what I've seen. But direct research, I don't have that. But that's an excellent question. I'm actually going to write that down. That's okay. So thank you yeah. for that. Yeah. I, I hope my yeah. indirect answer was okay. Yeah, no, I thought it was interesting too. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks for, for answering that. Um, can you elaborate on asking direct open questions and avoiding leading questions? Absolutely. If somebody is appearing distraught or they have gone through, right? Because we, we're looking, you know, what, what a person says is just one piece of what we do, right? So if somebody says, you know, Jessica, I'm not depressed, right? Their actions look different from what they're telling me. So if I see somebody in a situation where, you know, it's, it's, I may think that they're having those thoughts. I'll, I'll say, have you, are you having thoughts? Because that's a yes or no, right? Are you having thoughts of ending your own life? Yes or no? And let's say they so, say no and they look despondent. I might follow that up and say, hey, well, it's just because, you know, I know you've been through a lot. You're going through something traumatic. So I just wanted to make sure. And, you know, if, if you are having those thoughts, I want you to be comfortable talking to me about those. Uh, to go back about asking the direct questions, look up that Ask Suicide Questionnaire. So the ASQ, it has the direct questions on there. So that's a good place to start. And that's a great question because when we first rolled this training out in Riverside County, some social workers were saying, I wasn't trained to ask suicide questions. I am not comfortable asking those questions. That's why we have that tool. So we all have the same set of questions that we're able to ask those direct questions. Um, you know, indirect questions would be more read, beating around the bush. Um, I, I, I've seen social workers, uh, like a client maybe say, sometimes I just wanna go crawl under a rock and die. Well, is that a real situation where somebody's gonna crawl under a rock and die? No, and I've seen them say, oh, I'm sorry. Well, no, tell me, what, you know what, Mr. Smith, you just told me that you wanna crawl under a rock and die. What do you mean by that? So there's a direct question, or sometimes I just want to go to sleep and not wake up, right? You know, there's no action plan there necessarily in that statement, but well, what do you mean by that? Tell me what you mean by going to sleep and not waking up. Well, Jessica, I want to die. All right, so tell me about that. Are you having thoughts of ending your own life? So you can make those direct questions conversational, because that's what I struggled with at first, was how do I ask these questions without sounding rote or like I'm checking off the box. I hope that answer was helpful. Yeah, no, I think it was very helpful. Thank you. Um, all right, another question. We use the PHQ-9 routinely, uh, which is an older adult mental health assessment, but our geropsychiatrist says the geriatric depression scale is better. Do you have an opinion of this? I don't have an opinion on that other than Riverside County used to use the GDS and we went to the, the geriatric depression scale and we went to the PHQ-2 and 9 uh, because the questions were more similar to what the county hospitals in our area were using. So I can't speak to which tool is better. I can just let you know that we used to use the GDS as well. And then we went to um, the PHQ-2 and 9. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, is the statistic that um, you quoted earlier of social workers having a one in five chance of losing a client to suicide specific to APS workers? No, it is not. It's to helper professions, clinicians, caseload caring. Um, they even polled uh, hospital social workers on that poll. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, I would say social work practice and clinicians in general, uh, mental health clinicians. Excellent. Thank you. Um, let's see. Um, how do you help an older adult find meaning when they live alone 
have little supports, have significant health issues, and not much to look forward to. So this involves you know, social isolation, which we talk a lot about at APS. Absolutely. Uh, as I had said, great question. And, you know, it's kind of like a, I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but not a one size fits all approach, right? So it's being familiar with the resources in your area. Can we get a friendly visitor in the home? Can we get telephone reassurance? Are they willing to do that? Can we get potentially the doctor involvement? I've had clients that completely, completely isolate themselves. They push back on all the resources, which they're allowed to do, especially right when they're alert oriented. But many times if we got a doctor involved or could get like a telehealth visit or get a doctor out there and maybe put them, you know, talk about medications and stabilize them that way, they may be open uh, to more supports. But I always just try to validate what they're going through and that there is supports out there that can help. Do chronic illnesses interfere with a person's ability to grieve? Absolutely, they do. There's research on that as well. So it's working around that, how can we let them express their grief in a way that they're able to. So I brought up the gentleman who's, you know, I uh, was wearing his wife's uh, rings on the finger. He was able, he was mobile. So he was able to get out and go places. But what I can tell you is that the VA support group was online. So if you have a client that may be willing to go into those types of groups uh, that may be more online, then that's a very, very helpful resource uh, for those who are pushing back, I would just always let them know there are tools to help you. Are you going to be the same? Absolutely. No, absolutely not. Excuse me. I'm not going to go out there and say, we're going to fix this for you. Sure. Are you going to grieve? Absolutely. Is this going to be a loss for a long time? Is it going to hurt? Is it going to hurt to wake up in the morning? Absolutely. But if, you know, the pain, emotional pains like at a level 10 right now, can we knock it down to a six? And I don't literally say that to clients, but how can we at least relieve some of that emotional tension. Sure. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, another question. What best advice do you have for APS programs without a screening process for grief, depression, or suicide? That is a great question. So before we, I don't know if this will directly answer you, but I can tell you where we came from in Riverside County. It started with one supervisor, right? Because when we're when we're asking them if they have any, you know, depression diagnosis, anxiety, any substance abuse history, right? Those core questions we're asking, uh, we had one supervisor that said, you need to ask if there's a history of suicide. And so it started with one question, any history of suicide, not even current suicidal ideation, but any history of suicide or a 5150, so placed on an involuntary hold. So we started there. Um, and then we also, we also would use, you know, our, our senses to see if somebody looks distraught, they've gone through something, and then they say they have a history of suicide and follow it up with a question of, okay, you know, how are you having those thoughts right now? I think, this is my opinion, I'll, I'm gonna refer you to your organization, but you can embed those questions into your assessment without being formal, mm. without being formal, just like you asked about medical diagnoses. So. Uh, advice, I, I'm all for having policy on it. We have policy on it. We have the tools, but uh, you can definitely embed that as part of your social work practice. Great. Thank you. Very good advice. Um, let's see another question. Do you have suggestions on how um, we deal with personal grief loss and how to control emotions at work when helping families to deal with loss? This person says, I'm a crier and it is hard not to cry when I see others grieving or dealing with hard times. allow yourself to cry. It took a long time, and I, I don't share this with a lot of people, but um, I'm just being honest today because we're all being vulnerable. I kept it, I'm a crier too, and I kept it bottled up, and it started with one glass of wine when I got home from work and it felt better, then two glasses of wine, then three glasses of wine. I caught myself saying, I'm having three glasses of wine at night. What am I trying to mask? And then it was, feeling those feelings. And it's not good to feel those feelings sometimes, right? Seeing traumatic things, it's, it's, I don't want to normalize it, but it's a normal part of what we see every day. So what do you need to do to step out, right? So I replaced my three glasses of wine with another habit. I would come home and say, I had a hard day. I need to go take a bath. And I would cry it out in there, done with my bath, shut it down. Okay. I would go sit in the spa for 15 minutes. I would go outside and play with my dogs for 15 minutes and allow myself 
that time to cry. Uh, my husband and I, I also went down the road of talking about work all night. So what we do is we set a safe space aside for 20 minutes every day where I can cry, I can complain, I can say I'm upset about this, and then I shift my mind and say, my husband allowed time for me for this safe space to cry. Now I'm going to allow myself time to spend with him. So it's almost like an intentional schedule. So if you need to cry, go cry. Have I gone into homes before and dismissed myself and sat in my car and cried? Yes, I have. Yeah. Then I take a deep breath and then and do what I got to do. So give yourself that space. Great. Thank you, Jessica. Um, let's see another question. Um, this person referenced um, murder suicide cases and you know why are so many people these days taking their own lives along with the life of someone else? Is there any information you're aware of or um, research as to why this is happening or why it happens? So I, um, there's two ways that this can go. There's the it, it's oh goodness, it's the most common form of domestic violence, which is the intimate, partner suicide homicide, I believe. And that is suicide pact. And we are seeing that unfortunately a lot more where, and be weary of this too. I'm actually glad this question got brought up because you may go out in the field and they may say, I have a pact to kill myself and then, or to kill whoever gets a bad diagnosis and then take my own life sure. because they don't have those supports or emotional supports to watch that other person you know, lose their life to an illness that's usually debilitating. And then they think that there is no, there is no option for them to develop a new identity. And when I talk about developing a new identity, it's like, oh, moving on, let's go date. No, it is saying this person who I've lost, who I've watched suffer, you know, what is my identity with them while still missing them or still grieving them? So as far as the, uh, the suicide pact, I don't know where there's an uptick there. Uh, stuff that I've heard, nothing that I can prove with research is that uh, a lot of people are scared to go in a facility. Uh, a lot of people don't like the care in a facility. And a lot of people are, um, you know, just worried about, especially with Alzheimer's, because Alzheimer's is skyrocketing. So they, they've seen, they've cared for somebody with Alzheimer's. Now they get the diagnosis themselves, right? And know what that's gonna look like. As far as intentional murder suicide, I don't know about that. I'm just more familiar with the intimate partner suicide homicide. Excellent. I hope Thanks. that was helpful. Yeah, no, I think it, I think it was. Um, and you may not know the answer to this. Do you happen to know the rates um, of, of, didn't specify, but I'm wondering if it's suicide among Native American communities or maybe where that information could be found? Uh, I don't know. I can, I, I'm going to have my email on here after we're done with questions. So if you want to email me that, I can try looking into it. And uh, we actually have, I, this is for California, but we actually have a partner uh, over at one of the um, Indian tribes that does a lot of training on CPS and APS. So I could reach out to her if you want to email me directly. Great. Thank you. And that, this person who asked this question may want to check the SAMHSA website, Substance Abuse and Mental Health. Um, Services Administration, S-A-M-H-S-A, may have some, some um, statistics on that. Do you know of any resources for secondary traumatic stress and ideas for self-care? I think you shared a little bit about that, if you just want to recap that or share any new ideas. Yeah, I'm uh, counseling, obviously, right? That's, that's the kind of go-to answer. But debriefing, at least for me, let me talk about me, debriefing trauma with my coworkers and my supervisors was most helpful for me. Uh, I, I just really, like I said, it, it's, I, I don't mean this again in a disrespectful way, but social workers, first responders, we almost have that cynical type of eye, right, on society as a whole and being able to say, hey, I saw this and someone else say, hey, I saw, I saw this too. Uh, really, really helped me decompress. As far as self-care, I'm gonna use the word intentional again because we are so guilty of taking care of everybody except for ourselves. So say, you know, I'm going to set aside 20 minutes and I'm going to start my timer just for me. You know, um, there's all sorts. If you want to email me as well, I have all sorts of secondary trauma resources uh, that I hand out during my trauma training. So, uh, and Andy, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I don't know if we can make those handouts available. We probably uh, can. Well. Yeah, we probably okay. can. We can probably, I'm, I'm sure we can post those with the recording. Okay. Sure. Yeah, I have a huge self-care resource list. Um, 
including like downloads you can do, like breathe apps, like, you know, it'll tell you to breathe every so often. And then we have, uh, I created this for up north from, I believe it was the university, I, I'm sorry, University of Minnesota created something that I use up north. It's an intentional self-care plan. So it's not just, you know, here's what I'm gonna do to feel good. It's, it's you take an inventory and then it talks about the four different domains of self-care. So it's not just working out, it's physical, emotional, mental and spiritual and the different domains things you can do for self-care in each of those domains so uh, i will make a note of that and i would love to have all of that available for you all in kind of like a one-stop shop great um let's see and i think we one more question um this person says i have a client who has spoken openly about suicide as her end of life plan if she outlives her savings or is facing a debilitating terminal illness I've treated this suicidality as a real threat and conducted safety assessments, but this is a plan for the future that may not happen. I'm not sure what to do next. Do you have any suggestions? So I am going to answer this question two ways. One, it sounds like you're already doing a great job, um, you know, safety planning with her, service planning. Uh, ask her about the means. Does she have a means to do so? Uh, a time and place. I know you talked about, you know, um, once she runs out of savings, I would ask her, why do you feel like this is your only option? Let her explain to you why this is the only option, because it may be, well, then I'm going to be homeless. Well, it, I mean, it, there's things we can do to prevent that, let's say, if that's her answer. Sure. So uh, that's how I would approach it. The other thing I want to talk about is shared liability. If she's alert and oriented, this is a little bit different here, but when it comes to documentation, you know, make sure that you're documenting, that you're providing education on suicide prevention, whatever it may be, and that the client is alert and oriented and still expressing these um, uh, ideas. So, but uh, yeah, I would, I've, I've asked people before, why do you think this is your only option? And I've heard, well, I don't want to go into a nursing home. Okay, well, there's also something called boarding cares out there. Let's talk about that. And so, yeah, let's just see why that's the only option. That would sure. be my next step. Yeah, and explore options. That's great. Thank you, Jessica. Um, all right. So I think we'll just go to our, our last slide. I think, Jessica, you were going to share your contact information in case anybody wants to reach out. Yeah, here is my contact uh, information. I do want to thank each and every one of you again, I said at the beginning, but for taking the time to invest in your professional development. This job, it's it's quick, right? We don't have a lot of time, oh, yes. but uh, you all made time in your busy schedule today to attend this training. Uh, here is my email, jburke at wrma.com, and I also left my uh, business telephone number. Uh, so stay in touch. Would love to hear from you. Great. Thank you. And then moving on to our final slide, this is uh, contact information for the APS Start. Give our website here an email address where you can reach out to us and then all of our socials, and we would love it if you would follow us on social media um, and, you know, visit us there as well. Thank you so much to Jessica Burke today for providing all this great information. There's many comments here of Jessica saying what a great webinar this was and how helpful it was and how appreciative people are of all the information um, that you've given them, so thank you for that, and thanks to everyone for attending attending today. Um, this webinar, again, will be recorded and it will be posted in approximately three to four weeks on our website if you'd like to revisit it again. And thanks so much for joining us today. Um, take care, everyone. Have a good afternoon, evening, wherever you may be. Thank you.